All right, everyone, welcome back to uh, another edition of Esoteric Ex Libris, where we're going to be talking about uh, the antiquarian book world, specifically how it intersects with uh, the world of uh, Western esotericism, broadly construed. And uh, I'm really happy, really excited to be joined by James Gray, um, just a, a really wonderful guy that I've gotten to know through the, the book trade and, and buying and selling books. In fact, I recently at the Antiquarian Book Fair picked up a delightful copy, amazing copy of the um, of the medieval mystic Johannes Tauler, his uh, basically his complete works, along with a little bit of Meister Eckhart and other things from from James. So, uh, James, uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to come uh, hang out with me and, and talk about uh, antiquarian books and collecting them and building a collection and, and really uh, introducing the world of uh, folks from my world, from Western esotericism the world of uh in antiquarian books so james uh welcome and uh, maybe introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your uh about what you do sure um so i'm james gray i've been a um antiquarian uh, book dealer for 30 years or so um i specialize in books printed before 1700 um just to keep it orderly i buy all kinds of books all the time and I constantly read <laughs> but um what I sell is uh early books try to get as um big uh, uh as close a contact to the context of the books when they were written and read so um I do catalogs I do blogs I have a website all that stuff and um for the last eight or ten years now I've been working out of my home uh, my home office which you can see uh, before that I had a store in Harvard Square right across from um, the Houghton Library so um, I had a great traffic and met incredible interesting people and now I have to explain expand out um, using the the worldwide mystery web and um, seeing and meeting people this way and through shows and in my blog right and and i'll have links in the description uh for all, yeah. all of james's uh, connections so if you want to check out his catalogs and his blog which i subscribe to i really love his blog um and uh, james does really great descriptions of, of these texts and if you really want to see really sort of the inner workings of a of some of these antiquarian books james's um uh, catalogs and his descriptions are just really thick and, and wonderful. James, when you say early printing, just for folks who aren't familiar with the, the world of, uh, of antiquarian books, uh, give us a range of, of where your where your interests lie and the kind of books that you deal in. When you say early, early printing, what do you mean there? Um, so generally, I mean books printed uh, by the hand press method. And, um, and for um, practical purposes, before uh, the year 1700. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, you know, 1720 or something, I'll go if the text is really interesting or it's an important subject to me or my uh, uh, clients, customers. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I uh, also have early um, manuscripts before 1700. So um, I, generally have like a book of hours or um, some kind of scholastic text every once in a while I will get a um, you, you know Saint Augustine manuscript or, or something like that um, I try not to have too many of them at one time because they are so expensive and so valuable mm -hmm. and uh, pre prevents me from adding other things uh, more humble books to my inventory and I really do buy books um, almost only because I like them. I, I don't buy things that are just because they're sell on the market or there's some a rich collector out there buying it. I buy books that I can read, that I can work with and that I can um, contextualize. What's the earliest uh, printed book that you've, 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 that's passed through your hands? uh 1469 so that's um you know within the first 15 years or first yeah first 15 or 14 years of um printing history that's and um yeah 
yeah, anything from the 60s is, is really early. Uh, right now, I have two or three that are on the border. Um, a lot of times, they weren't dated um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And you've sort of got to go from uh, scholarly hearsay, <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it. But, uh, I have many books um, on the shelf that there's three or four uh, contingencies and um, that, that make people date it different ways. Right. And it's and, and just so folks know, we're talking about the 1460s and 1470s. This is uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's a habit for me. Yeah, so um, yeah, and pretty much um, the way I organize things, uh, in, in when I do a show or when I do a catalog or um, even even when I make um, uh, storage, it is by century just to make them handleable. So what you're looking at from behind me is you can see right here. Here's like a my working uh, notebook of 15th century books, and this shelf and this shelf are all 15th century. There's some spillover here into the lower shelf, which is 16th century. This is um, a section of uh, 15th century books on hold right now, and um, and then. 16th century over there and then the big shelf let's see if you guys can see that how about that um so this is all 17th century except for the top shelf which is um reference books mm -hmm. and um, we'll, we'll talk about that i think a little later that will come into it and um let's see and then you can see here is uh, my cockpit. So this is where I do most of my work. You can see the computer, the messy desk, um, and more reference books. So um, er early books um, aren't particularly valued by their date or um, how big they are or things like that that a lot of people or the, the worst the worst thing that people say to me all the time is like oh they must be all bibles because that's all they had then and as you know <laughs> there's a lot more to books than bibles i think right now i do not have any bibles <laughs> no bibles <laughs> in there bible free so, um yeah. yeah it's funny because i you know in all my when what little collecting i do i don't have any bibles either um i, I you know the, yeah like you said it, it, we think of the world of uh the middle ages as the the bible and that's it and of course that's that's uh, not true james how'd you get into this business how'd you get into the world of uh dealing in in, in rare books uh how did that how, how did you arrive there so i um was um an anthropologist and um had a hard time finding a job where I didn't have to travel to some bizarre place and be away from uh, my family and all that. So I um, took a job as an archeologist and also had to travel, but it was a much smaller travel. I did a public archeology, span which meant going um, to sites where there was uh, public construction, public finance construction, and making sure that they weren't destroying archaeological um, sites and artifacts. And while I did that, I would have downtime on rainy days and things like that in foreign cities, and um, would go to bookstores. Hmm. Wandered into a bookstore and found a, a book I've never seen since, um, which um, was Vosius's uh, Latin Greek uh, lexicon and it was from 1640 or something and it was within my budget which at the time was four or five hundred dollars and I was like wow I can use this even you know nudge nudge wink wink and it's <laughs> like oh so well this is a workbook you know and um, I brought it home and I, I was just thrilled and I just like oh my god I can buy these things and then I started looking and I found more and more. 
And then I found a, a book at an auction in Sotheby's that I really, really wanted. And it was in a lot, uh, meaning there was six other books that you had to buy with it. And I bought those. And then I had these six other books or five other books that I couldn't use and didn't want. And then I tried to sell them to other book dealers. And that did not work. <laughs> no one wanted them. <laughs> So I talked to uh, the librarian at the Harvard Library, um, the rare book librarian, and he said, oh, these are perfectly good books. You should sell them to other libraries. And I said, would you like to buy any? He's like, oh, absolutely not. We have all of these. And then he showed me how to use the union catalog, which they had at the time, um, uh, which is a catalog of all the books in all the libraries in the United States from 1965 and before. So it's, uh, I think it's like 800 volumes, big, huge volumes. Um, and um, so I, I went and looked up my books in those and then found that Brown didn't have one and UCLA didn't have another one. So I, I went there and went to Brown and offered them the book and they said, yeah, we'll take it. And all of a sudden I paid for that lot. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> this is more fun than digging holes with undergrads. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, set up, I set up a plan and um, borrowed some money from um, a couple of other professors I knew and um, went to town, bought 30 books, made a catalog, did a book show, sold those and I've been going ever since. And that was, that was before, get this guys, before the internet. <laughs> so, so I had to travel a lot. So um, immediately what I did is I, I went to London because I knew there was lots of bookstores there and went to the bookstores and would go to the British library after going to the bookstores and look up in their copy of the um, union catalogs who had copies and I would try to sell them before I got home and uh, UCLA was one of my very first customers and they were great and I could call them on the phone they said to me just don't even worry about looking at it. just call us up and we'll we'll look for you and tell you if we have it or not so I started selling um, Italian uh, late renaissance books and learned a lot about them and you know, then I um, found a couple of dealers in Italy who could help me out. And, and then I was like, uh, able to pay my rent and expenses and uh, stop being an archaeologist. <laughs> but, yeah, it's amazing that that story, how often I hear that story is that people, uh, they buy a book and then buy another book to pay for the other book. And then it becomes a uh, the snowball begins to roll down the hill, um, which I, right. I that's the same for me. Um, so it's mm -hmm. I try to subsidize my book buying by my meager little um, book selling. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to drill down into the, the the topic. I think most people who are uh, fans of the channel would really like to know a lot more about. I you know I make the joke as much as it is a joke that the Venn diagram between people who are interested in sort of esotericism and the people who are interested in, in rare books is basically a circle uh, that they tend mm -hmm. to be uh, they tend to be very interested in that. But I was wondering sort of what is the, the general place of the sort of uh, occult books? You know, we think of books related to the occult, and, and I mean that really broadly construed. Mysticism, magic, uh, you know, Inquisition stuff, uh, you know, right. e even medical journals and sort of really broadly mm -hmm. construed uh, thinking about the, the world of, of occult books, Kabbalah, uh, alchemy. Um, do those books, what are those place, what is the place of those books in the rare book world? You know, often people have the image of, uh, I don't know if you've seen the ninth gate with Johnny Depp of, you know, yeah. of all the, the devil worship and all the kind of bizarre things going right. on with that. But are, are, do these books have a, a special pride of place in the, in the rare book world? Or are they especially valuable? Or are they especially sought after? Uh, what's your, what's your read on their, their, um, their placement in the world of, of, of rare book dealing? I think the obvious books are are highly sought after and very important um the malleus maleficarum is a great example i've had a um second edition of that and i've had four or five other editions and um 
it, it, it's easy for me to sell. Um, it's it's a hard book to find. It's an expensive book, and it's it's hard for me to buy sometimes because I have to like bite my knuckle because I pay more now than I used to for them, and they become very expensive. But there's fewer and fewer every day. Um, the non um, obvious occult books are the things that sort of interest me the most. I think um, I think the word occult is just wonderful. It means not obvious or hidden in a sense. And I think that every in every book, there's a lot hidden. And, um, and then there's books that deal with exposing the hidden, which are the things that I like from... Um, you know, histories of mythology to, um, you know, medical discoveries and uh, mystical experiences and, um, you know, right down to spells. I, I sold um, uh, a few books in my career to Ricky Jay, who had like one of the best magic collections ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time I saw him, I had a, a perfect book. It was it was from uh, the 1490s and it was magical spells and it was in Latin and um, I showed it to Ricky and I said, you know, I've got one that you have to have. And he started reading it and it was Latin. His Latin was okay. And he's like, oh no, no, this is not for me. This is real magic. <laughs> this is a real spells. <laughs> I want sleight of hand. I, I want you know, the trickery aspect of it, not deep spiritual black stuff. And um, so I, I do have a customer for that too. So th that's where that went. Um, but- um, And how often a, do books like that appear on the market? You know, a book of a grimoire or, a, you know, CLM 849, the famous uh, Munich Necromancer's Manual is the, the one that's academically best known. And I think at the fair last year, uh, they had a 18th century grimoire um, mm -hmm. that was, I think they wanted 30 right. grand for it or something like that. How often those right. kinds of books come come to the to the market? Um, I'd say uh, there's, there's collections out there. Mm -hmm. um, and when the collections sell, then they're on the market for five or six years and then they sort of disappear. And then another collection will sell. I, I bought a lot at the Rittman sale, which you know about. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the Rittman catalog is on my desk at all times um, because I read it constantly and I get new ideas about what mm -hmm. constitutes uh, um, that kind of a book. And for folks um, who may not know, the, the Rittman library is probably the largest semi-public, semi-private library of, of hermetic or occult books, uh, basically in the world and their their catalog, mm -hmm. um, which I've actually touted before. You can buy it from their website. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, just if you want a beautiful uh, couple of books uh, that uh, contain other descriptions of beautiful books, it's only about 50 euro, I think, to buy the catalog. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I also have it uh, just, I was actually looking at it just over there. Uh, so I bought a, an Aldine and was looking at their catalog mm -hmm. to see how it matched with theirs. So, um, but yeah, um, but yeah, you would say that, you know, they come to these kinds of books come to market, you know, um, yeah. not infrequently. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not, no, there's, not, um, there's witchcraft books that show up all the time. And, um, right now I'm doing uh, an interesting little project, which is, um, Jesuit books on a cult. Hmm. And I, I, have a blog in the works. So I would say within the next three weeks, I will have probably five or six books on the occult by Jesuits. And it, it's, it's an interesting thing um, to me, the difference between what they call natural magic and artificial magic and what gets blamed on um, the devil or Satan and what gets blamed on the, uh, the, uh, unfinishedness of science and then oh we're, we'll, figure, we'll figure this one out that one that's just evil <laughs> you yeah. know we're not going to be able to figure it out 
so yeah, it is funny how we uh, kick that and uh, and you know pe people may know that you know that uh martin del rio probably i would say is probably the most famous yes. jesuit to have composed his, right. his disinquitora magicarum is probably the most important encyclopedia of the occult uh, written in, in in this period it's a really amazing and, really amazing yeah. book i've handled uh probably six or seven of them it first came out in 1599 mm -hmm. and it went through four or five editions in the 17th century so it, it's a fairly obtainable, super important book, and it would be a great place. Um, if somebody came to me and said, you know, I'm starting um, a, a small library on a cult and I'm in uh, normal means, I have a healthy income, but I'm by no means wealthy, what would I get? I would say, I can find you a Del Rio. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's just a great book. In fact, I generally don't buy them anymore because so many of my customers have them. <laughs> and and, um, and if there's something special about a copy or, or something like that, I'll buy it. But uh, do you have one? I do. I have two, actually. Um, I, have, I have two. Um, one earlier and one slightly later, although the later one has a nicer binding. Um, but mm -hmm. for folks, I don't I actually have it right there. Um, <laughs> it's funny if I can just reach around and grab it. No, it's in my shelf, but um, but sure. uh, for yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, so it's great because if, if you want a book, that's where that's why it's so great because it's it's the most Harry Potter of the witchcraft books because it's so huge. Um, yeah. so it's it's a it's and it's encyclopedic. I mean, the it, it really covers everything. He quotes Agrippa. He does a whole chapter on alchemy. It's really the I, I agree with you, James. Uh, and it really was for me the, the first major sort of book like that that uh, that I bought. Because sometimes you can find copies for just a few thousand dollars, sometimes even less than that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Because it went in so many editions, and it's it's not as well known as Malleus Maleficarum, so it doesn't have the uh, the the fashion branding of of Malleus. Right. Uh, but mm -hmm. you get that good Jesuit learning, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Springer. And, it's easier. It's easier to read. Oh yeah, I think. it's way easier, and yeah. more encyclopedic. And also, people, you know, Malleus Maleficarum is more well known. But I mean, the guy that wrote it was kind of crazy, and it's not actually a very well written book. And it's sort of, it's, it, at times, it reads like a screed. Um, but does. yeah, and 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 um, Del Rio is a much more careful. He's a Jesuit. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, he, he, yeah, he reads like a Jesuit. So uh, it's mm -hmm. a fantastic book in that way. Well, that sort of gets to my I guess my next question is: if you were to sort of shorthand, and we just mentioned one, the Disinquitora Magicarum, mm -hmm. uh, but if you were to shorthand, you know, let's say five books that you think would be a good place for people to start. And again, we're thinking about books here that, you know, uh, people with some money, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not to break the bank with a, you know, $5,000 cop $5, copy of Malleus, but what would be the kind of books that you would recommend people be on the lookout for, or that you would say, these are the kind of core books that would begin to the process of building a, a collection of uh, occult or esoteric volumes in, 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 mm -hmm. in this period of early printing. Well, um, you know, part of it is is language base. Um, uh, so Glanville's book on witchcraft, uh, he, mm. he really did two books on witchcraft, is fairly common. Um, again, a few thousand dollars for a good one. It went through a, probably four editions in the period that I'm interested in. Um, and that's so, Saduki Smooth Trim Fastus? Is that the one you're thinking yes. of? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Sadducism Triumphant. Has those great woodcuts yeah. too of people floating in the air and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So, so that that's a that's one of the books that I think is just you know like oh I have a book on witchcraft in English that everyone can read, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and with 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 pictures in it, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, let me think. What else? Um, so I'm I'm also interested in. American, um, so George Starkey always comes mm -hmm. to mind. He was an American alchemist, as well as um, uh, John Winthrop, mm -hmm. and um, so so that the those are books that I'm always buying. Um, there's um, a and book folks by may, guy may know may, may know Starkey better as Philolithes. He he published under right. author under Philolithes. Um, and he's wrapped up right. with, you know, Von Helmont and, and, uh, right. and, and those guys. So he's really at the cusp of, 
uh, alchemical right. modernity. He's he's great in that way. Um, so he's really wrapped up with with those guys. So he's a he's a really great well, one. So von Helmont. Um, in fact, I sold uh, one of his books at the show mm -hmm. uh, to a medical library, and um, and um, they uh, collect paracelsian books, which mm. paracelsus is somebody that I've always been interested in. Um, I think, um, oh, in um, one of Davy's books, uh, do you know that book where um, Paracelsus is one of the characters? It's just a great book. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, so, so that's like one aspect of it. I personally am, am more drawn to um, the mystical spiritual books. So, and to me, in fact, I had a dream about um, um, a St. Bonaventure's um, uh, Spiritual Tears book that I found a copy of it that was unknown. And, you know, I, I dream about these things. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that I had seen one at the show, but it wasn't in very good condition. And, I, and it was like way overpriced. So I passed it up and now it's haunting me. But, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Meister Eckhart, uh, Taller Suso, um, and, and then, and then there's a lot of um, um, Christian mystics that are out there and available, and you just have to do the work and mm -hmm. find them. Um, I just saw, and I, I don't think I got it, um, a St. Gertrude um and there's a lot of um there, there's a lot of very occult mystical things happening with especially female saints in the 17th century um, yeah most of them most of them could fly uh which is just an interesting thing uh, mm -hmm. it it was uh sort of a pushback from i think witchcraft in a way that just because you can fly doesn't mean you're a witch mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, oh, um, yeah, and that's another thing that people forget that there's a lot of great uh, Bernardo Clairvaux, a really important um, yep. um, Christian mystic. You, you can find volumes his his complete mystical works mm -hmm. are often yeah. uh, often in huge folio editions that are really beautiful and not terribly expensive. Right, or very early uh, sermons, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is maybe a good way to begin. Um, I, I think it's it's a great way to begin. So. Um, my Taller uh, sermon here is, um, it's only eight leaves. So if your um, German's not up to snuff yet, this is a great a motivator <laughs> to sit down with the dictionary and work your way through it, get used to it. And you fall in love with it. The more time you put into a book, the more you're going to like it and the more value you're getting out of it. So I would say something like this would be a great way to start if you are familiar with, um, you know, an author. And, and uh, what made me think of it is I, I have four or five uh, Bernard of Clairvaux's um, sermons. Uh, one of them's on friendship um, that I will be getting in a month or two. And um, they're pretty much spoken for already because I have a customer who is writing their thesis on them right now. Mm. And they have, um, uh, they have a very, very nice parent that will help them out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but there's still, as, a, as opposed to like getting the, um, God, I think there's an 1838 uh, Variorum edition that came out in Germany that's literally 15 volumes and could take up the top shelf here and, and that would be you know eighteen thousand dollars to buy that or you can just go by the sermons and you know when earlier editions show up or or things like that you can afford them and you know if you want the very arm edition you can always go to the library or something like right. that Right. And that brings, so cool. I guess, brings me to my, my second question or next question rather is let's, you know, talk, you know, prices, like what, you know, uh, antiquarian books, rare books that, you know, that, that means a price tag, but, um, 
you know, like, you know, when you're thinking about sort of like uh, that, the sermons of Tyler, this, uh, that sermon of Tyler you printed back there, and mm -hmm. I'll be making an episode, by the way, on Johannes Tyler here pretty soon. Folks may not know mm -hmm. him. He's, he, he often is uh, passed over because of uh, folks like Eckhart, but uh, Tyler really is responsible in a big way for popularizing uh, Eckhart's uh, more yeah. wild ideas, his more like, you know, dangerous mystical ideas, one could say. He popularized mm -hmm. them, and they they really, in a big way, led to all kinds of huge spiritual revolutions in, in, in Germany with the rise of theosophy and everything else. So he's a hugely important character. And what's interesting about him is that he was very he was a very conversational preacher. Uh, he was known for mm -hmm. preaching to common people and making very difficult mystical ideas very accessible to the common population, which is... Mm -hmm. uh, he's a super interesting guy. So I'll be making an episode about Tyler. But, you know, when you think about... Uh, you know, prices, uh, you know, what can folks expect to pay for some of, some of these kinds of volumes? Um, I'd say a few thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. um, meaning like one or two, you can get a book from mm -hmm. this period on, you know, the most incredible subjects. Um, so the, the Glanville, uh, I think is going to be around $2,500 for, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, English book on witchcraft, which is, which is, you know, a starting point. You can go up and up and up. Um, and so there's, there's scarcity on the market. There's scarcity in, in general. I think um, uh, a fine example of the up and up and up is uh, my Suso. And um, this is um, just it's incredibly rare on the market. It's um, incredibly rare in existence. There's only uh, one other copy of this known that I know of. There's a few earlier ones on the market, and then you can add a couple more zeros. So this is a $22,000. The um, There's another copy on the market that has a little bit more to it. Well, it has a hell of a lot more to it. But it's also a hundred thousand dollars more than that, right? So that's where you can go. Um, I I generally don't um, go much over fifty or sixty thousand dollars for my stuff. Um, almost all of my sales are around two uh, two thousand dollars and up. Every once in a while, I will have a starter book or something that. Um, you know, there's something wrong with it that I, but I can't like let it go. I have um, a book on er erotomania that's lacking a few pages, and I had I had a perfect copy that I sold for nine thousand dollars, and the the hurt ones just looking for a scholar who's dying for it or you know a collector, and and then I can just say okay what can you do? You know, it, it's going to be more than $900, but we're building a relationship, which is mm -hmm. probably something that I think that we should talk about too with the um, antiquarian book world intersecting with the occult or esoteric is that you need a, you need to have a relationship with somebody, um, you know, that you're going to spend a few a thousand dollars on something that you don't quote unquote need <laughs> you know you don't mind you know the transmission falls out of your car you gotta pay three thousand dollars for that that's you don't have to have a relationship with the mechanic per se but if you're gonna buy something that you're gonna live with and you're gonna enjoy you have to know um that you're buying it from somebody who who has your um has your your desires and needs in, in in his mind when when they sell you the book um and you can explain to the to the person uh the book dealer what you want right. i i know that <laughs> justin and i when we first met it was we were speaking the same language it, it wasn't hard for me to understand what he was talking about and he understood that i knew that and I think that that makes a good relationship. And um, I have customers that I've had for 30 years. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I have any, maybe one or two customers that have had problems with me. And I think that there was sort of more self, uh, self-imposed problems, but you know, um, I do this because I love it and I want to make it easy for my uh, clients and friends to like, you know, there's nothing more than I like to, to talk about these things and sit down and have like a, a long talk with somebody about the relationship between Suso and Teller and, and Eckhart. And, you know, uh, when I, I have a customer for this Suso that I haven't pushed over the edge yet, and I'm trying to explain to her that Suso's sermons were collected by nuns and, mm-hmm. and put together by nuns. So this is like um, a blending of the, the male controlled spirituality in the uh, late medieval period and putting women in the power of almost being the editor of it and, mm-hmm. and being responsible for spreading these ideas. So they become not only masculine ideas, but feminine ideas. So, and that's really true of Eckhart and Tyler too, that they were very much wrapped up in the world of of women and women. And in many ways, I would say that Eckhart is a great example of someone who was basically sent there to kind of tame these women, but the opposite happened is that the women kind of uh, inspired him. Yeah. Fed fed the uh, passion. Yeah. No, I I totally. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, I think it's a huge, uh, again, we we talk about Tyler and Suzo and Eckhart, but really it's the the army of women uh, behind them mm-hmm. that really are the drive in many ways the driving forces behind their theological and mystical innovations in, in yeah. so many ways. Uh, and also, I think another thing about Suzo that's really important is just how emotional his sermons are. Um, right. We we you know Eckhart is such a cold, distant, but in an intense and brooding mm-hmm. mystic, and um, mm-hmm. Suzo is just like the most emotional. Uh, mm-hmm you know, uh, outpouring of, of love and intensity. And it's interesting. We group them together, but they're so different. Uh, Tyler too. Tyler is also, he's the kind of guy you want to have a beer with and talk about God. Yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. And mm-hmm. you know, um, an- another thing that I, I, I want to bring up is uh, about the reading of these books. So Suso and Tyler and Eckhart are all available in great English translations and you can get the original and put it next to each other and, and learn a lot. Uh, learn a lot about um, just the transmission and, and other languages and um, how important um, people like uh, Suso and Richard Roll are to um, English philosophy. Mm-hmm. And, and there's, you know, a whole collection of, um, uh, Julian, and there's a whole group of English mystics, um, which I also buy all the time when I see them. And unfortunately, they're much, much rarer than the than the Rhenish or German ones. Um, and therefore, they're much, much more expensive. The last um, Richard Roll I had was uh, printed in um, London in 1506 or something like that and it went for about forty five thousand dollars wow right but and i think one of the books but, that you have in your your stock right now that i'm i'm uh, eternally envious of is the uh, the letters of marsilio facino folks of the friends of the channel will will know facino he's such a linchpin character in all this and you you have that really amazing copy of uh, facino's letters which um, is uh, early printing, not just early printing, but also uh, hand colored and illuminated. It's a really beautiful edition. It's uh, yes. beyond my beyond my price point, but uh, a volume that uh, every time I've you've had it at the at the shop, I've or at the fair, I've uh, wanted to stop by and yeah. look at. Yeah, folks can see the the illuminated uh, M. Yeah, um, and um, this one has notes in it, annotations. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there you can see them go. at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. And throughout throughout the book, there's uh, little notes. These are just spectacular letters in general. <laughs> um, and in particular, the, the importance of uh, Ficino, um to 
platonic learning in the Renaissance is is like a, a cornerstone. I think right. He is the gate through which it all flowed at some level. Um, he is like yes. uh, you really have to. And Pacino is just an important character. And this is a beautiful book. It's a beautiful. His letters are so great, and the you know they give you also they give you a link into his personal thinking, and um, they're really mm -hmm. lovely and in that way but um yeah i love that that's one of my favorite volumes that you you've had in catalog um what are some of the what are you in in terms of this genre what are some of the your favorite books that have come through your collection uh and through your through your dealings and in, in your career what are some of the standout volumes that uh that you've 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 worked with or handled well uh, of course the malleus um and um oh um well it escapes me because i i had it for literally a day um the book called the anthill um oh yeah the another... formicarius by johann's nider yes yeah, the that's, nider that's, yeah then, yeah yeah then formicarius it's the for folks who don't know this book this is it really is that is the malia steals the show but the formicarius is really the foundation of of the witch theory uh johann's mm -hmm. nider really is the one to really put it forward first yeah um so so that book is illustrated, which is mm. great. And almost all of the uh, iconic images of witches flying and stuff like that came from that book. Um, and are you maybe you're I, thinking of Ulrich Molitor's? Are you thinking of the oh uh, yeah, De La I'm Mia, uh, De, De, no, De La Mia? Uh, yes. So I had them both at the same oh, time. Yeah, yeah the and, De La Mia um, is incredibly rare. That's uh, yeah. And it, it, yeah, I've done an, I've done an episode on the, on the De Lama East. It's a fantastic, yeah. for folks who want to yeah. check that episode out. But yeah, the, the images of the witches in flight and the witches Sabbath yeah. uh, and yeah, yeah, the, um, yeah, so yeah, that's a, the Niter, that's a the, Niter, the Niter had one image in it, I think, mm -hmm. or maybe two, but, um, so yeah, it was an interesting, it was a, it's an interesting thing that I bought them, um, from a, a somebody who who I met in London 30 years ago or 20 years ago and sent catalogs to over and over and over again and offered him books and never bought anything for me. Nothing was like right for him. And um, he, was, um, he became ill and his wife contacted me and said, oh, we loved your catalogs and he loved reading them and loved you so much. And we're going to sell some of his books. Would you please come see him? I was like, wow, he never bought anything for me. He never talked to me. It's just like a, a mailbox that I sent things to. And I went and I was just blown away by what he had. And I could only afford those two books. And I spent way more than I thought I should have. And it came home and wrote little descriptions of them and sent them off to my usual suspects. And sure enough, um, I got four orders that day and, and the books went out. Yeah. I mean, uh, at, at least now in the market, I, I've seen a copy, a colored copy actually of the Delami East. I think it, that's, mm -hmm. it's a hundred thousand dollar book easy these days. Yeah. It was close to that. Um, yeah. then, and, um, yeah, so they went to two different big, uh, witchcraft collections. Uh, one of them went to Cornell and one of them went to Toronto. Mm. Cornell has so. a really great witchcraft collection. I think they have the best, maybe the one of the best in the country. Yeah. And um, according to um, uh, what the librarians say now is they're not adding to it anymore. Mm. I guess the, the funds are gone and it just now it's a, you know, a research collection, right. which is a shame. Cause I do yeah, have, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are amazing. The Formicarius is a really cool book. I, um, um, folks may know this, that often uh, after the 17th century, it's often the case that Formicarius and Malleus Maleficarum and several other books are always bound together. Oh, I think the last yeah. time, I think the last time that Malleus is, is floats on its own is a, the Venice edition, which is, it's, uh, I forget, the 14, it's a 1570s or so. I have, I have one of the, yeah. my copy of Malleus is the Venice edition, which is yeah, uh, an interesting one because yeah. it's not printed in the, in the in germany it's a it's printed in catholic oh. uh, and catholic italy oh that's interesting yeah yeah it's i think hmm. they only ran two editions it's the last there was two editions printed in venice of malleus and that's the last time it ran on its own after that it was always bound hmm. with 
um, right. uh, yeah. with other things. So it's yeah. an interesting volume in there. So I guess to, to start wrapping up, uh, this is sort of a mm -hmm. funny question, but uh, I, people often ask me this, you know, when you have these books on your shelf, you know, you have Miley's Miley Picard, which is, a, in my opinion, a pretty frightening book to have. There's a lot of blood mm -hmm. on the hands of that book in a lot of ways. Um, uh, yes. And, uh, but, you know, are there any books that you've, that you've, that have come through your collection or come through your, your, your trade that, you know, creeped you out or gave you bad yeah. vibes that you're like, I, I want to get rid of this. I, I, uh, or that, uh, I don't know, you know that, that you felt uh, uncomfortable I having have a, or. I have a couple. I don't know where one of them is. Um, but um, yeah, it it's um, it's a little Italian pamphlet. I think there's, there's only like one other copy known. And um, it's, it's about killing babies. And um, this town in Italy um, decided that the women were all witches and then they killed all their babies for like a total of like 38. And it describes it. And it's like, wow, I don't know. So I immediately, in fact, I offered it to Cornell. Um, I knew that um, I didn't have to write much of a description or read much of it. And they didn't take it. And it was like, okay, I, I don't want to really write about this or, you know, it, it's just so evil. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that. And then um, there's a, a couple of other books where um, I, I think, um, you know, that I've been creeped out because of um, <clears throat> the, the blatant sexism and racism and, uh, mm. but not, not so much esoteric things, but right. the, the burning of, of babies and women because of um, the conception of witchcraft just seemed, you know, I bought it because because it, it was it was just so rare I couldn't resist it and it was like in a little Italian auction that really described just the title of it and I could you know it, it said you know it had something about um demonic possession of women and children in the title and is you know 10 15 pages and I you know. I bought it <laughs> and now I still got it. And, but like I said, I don't even know where it is. It's probably in a box somewhere of things I'll get to catalog someday. Is it in which, Italian or, or in Latin? It's in Italian. Hmm. Yeah. And this is the thing I think that people often, you know, from, for me, and maybe this is true for you too, James, is that the books written by the actual mystics or the occultists or the magicians or the sorcerers, they never strike me as terribly terrifying. It's the ones written by the witch hunters that, yeah, like you know, Malleus is horrifying because of his yeah. his his rage, his misogynistic rage, mm -hmm. and it just leeches you know off of every page. And and you know, to me, what's I'm not really that scared of a sorcerer. The worst they you know the worst they could do is ruin my crops. I'm scared yeah. of institutories. <laughs> exactly. uh, yeah. uh, institutories mm -hmm. could could ruin the lives of and did ruin the lives of, of tens of thousands yeah. of women. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, that's those There's are the, the creepy ones to me. Yeah, there's a book like that on the Inquisition in Goa. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, Dali, uh, another, oh, what's his name? Um, Delon, uh, I think, something like that. Delone. Delone is his name. And uh, in there, they have um, a, a fold out woodcut of a heretic wearing the her heretic's miter and his hands like tied behind him and then like another woodcut of them being burned um so you know the inquisition is real yeah <laughs> and, it's you know that that's really frightening you know that's that's the kind of thing that i get creeped out by yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, i think if i have a copy of nicholas emmerich's the disinquitorum uh not disinquitorum the uh uh his his uh, uh what is it called in latin um it it's the it's it, it's it's one of the early inquisition manuals and mm -hmm. when you get to the sections that are directorium inquisitorum that's what it is by nicholas yeah, emmerich um oh, when yeah. you get to the sections on torture um mm -hmm. and you're like oh yeah this is really real like somebody mm -hmm. read this and did they followed these manuals 
So yeah, and you know, even some of the medical books really creep me out too. The ones with like um, uh, the uh, tumors and, and uh, births and things like that. Though I do, I do buy uh, uh, Gaspar shots, uh, Physica Curiosa all the time. I have one in the mail, in fact, coming. Um, and that has 75 pages of monsters in it, right? Um, which are real births, but monstrosities nonetheless. Right. It goes and, back to uh, Aristotle, right? the, the, the defects right. of nature or whatever, the monstroi, as Aristotle yes. calls them. Uh, right. Yeah, those... Yeah, those are, and, and again, us is also, I think those volumes are really interesting because it, we take for granted just how good our medical, how far medicine has come. Uh, yeah, you, sanitizing you know, our perception of like what birth is like, I think right. is, you know, is a way yeah. of putting it, you know, that they still happen. We just don't ever see it or find out about them. Right. Yeah. And seeing them in these older books, you just realize, oh, yeah. The, <laughs> Again, this is also why I, people who often fantasize to me about, you know, I was born in the wrong time. I wish I lived in the Middle Ages. I'm like, no, you, you've not read enough book, books about the Middle Ages. Uh, right, that fantasy right. will come rapidly to a conclusion if you uh, yeah. looked at some old books about it. So, mm -hmm. well, James, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to come on the yeah. channel. And, uh, and uh, again, where can people find you if they have questions or, you know, um, I know, again, you, you said that, uh, you know, sort of a $2,000 price point is a pretty good price point to getting a the beginnings of, sure. of a library, um, you know, I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, folks on the channel, you know, would maybe want to reach out to you. So, uh, yeah, yeah, where can folks find you and, and um, um, you know, your offerings? Yeah, so uh, James Gray Bookseller, uh, just type that in and you should be able to find me. Uh, my blog is James Gray 2 uh, uh, me. And, and my blog will pop right up. Um, and um, yeah, and let me, um, let's see if I can like turn this way and just touch the computer. Yeah, so there's my blog and it's just James Gray too. Um, yeah, and I'll have go. a link, I'll have a link in the description for folks to find it. So, so, uh, so that, that's when you cut me. And um, uh, my phone number's on there too. Um, and it will be on, it'll be linked on. Um, and, and just call me and hopefully you have a few minutes to talk because, um, I'll have something to tell you about, um, a book that would be good for you. I think that, you know, to go back to the esoteric and occult as a theme, I think there's an occult content to almost every book. If you look at it deeply enough, you can read John Donne or Shakespeare, or, you know, or you know, the sermons of St. Francis. I mean, there's something in there special for you to find. And, and that's, that's sort of the way I go at it. Yeah. So yeah, folks, well, reach out to James if you're interested in really diving into, you know, collecting some antiquarian books. You know, again, I, I, I've worked with James. Uh, this is my copy of Tyler I recently got from, uh, from him at the uh, New York Book Fair. Uh, I justified also buying this because uh, a lot of Tyler is not translated to English. His complete works have not been translated. The, uh, the, 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 this is, this, there are more sermons in here than have been translated. So um, it's good for me to be able to flip around through those and, and look through some of Tyler's sermons. Uh, and also reading them in sort of his uh, translation, the, you know, the really originally given in, in German, but translated into Latin. So it's nice to see that transition. But James, thank you again for taking the time to hang out with me and yeah. chat about old books. And uh, folks, if you want to reach out to uh, to James uh, with interest, please do. And again, those descriptions, uh, the links will be in the description um, below. But uh, all right, folks. Well, until next time, um, I will see folks soon. But um, yeah, again, thank you again, James. Thank you. I can't wait to hear from your um, viewers. <laughs>